Thank you so much. Uh, I have a really difficult task right now. I'm in between you and your lunch. And I have to keep you engaged and I have to keep you awake. So I would request for all your participation. And uh, yes, uh, I'm just going to just take a little bit of your time and share some of my learning over the last 30 years. And I might be doing a, something wrong with the clicker, in which case I'll ask for help. Yeah, so that's me. Uh, the reason I have uh, got a next slide is just to tell you who I am. So I was born in Calcutta to a very uh, diversified kind of a multi-generational family. From there, I uh, moved on after doing my master's into something called PR. Didn't have a clue what it was. Started my life as a journalist. And overnight, literally moving to Statesman, got a call. Somebody said, do you want to try out PR? That was about 30 years ago, exactly 30 years ago. And uh, from then, found my life partner, Nikhil, in the course of my journey. And now together we have a family. I don't, couldn't put my rescue pups picture, but together we have a family of Neil, Nikhil, and I. And of course, PR is a huge part of that. As I said, my... So these are the companies I worked in. Why I wanted to share this with you is just to talk about uh, my topic, which is all about future and all about change. Um, just the panel before us. They were debating about how to be more efficient, how to be more uh, useful to each other across multi-generational workforce. So we were actually talking a little bit about the future. So I started, as I said, as a journalist many years ago, then moved into PR, worked across multiple companies. Um, my last job was with Unilever, which I handed over in July, and now I'm uh, on my own, doing a lot of mentoring work, doing consulting, uh, and yes, having a lot of fun in the process. So we all talk about uh, future perfect. You know, we, we are all talking in terms of how it's going to be when tomorrow will come. I have been often asked, uh, what is going to be the shape that this business of ours is going to take? Are we going to have our jobs? Is AI going to come and take it away? And what is going to be the shape of this whole new future that we are looking at? So the future for me is also my past, which means that my journey in the last 30 years has seen a lot of evolution and a lot of change. And where I am today has actually seen changes which, sorry, the changes which actually are clearly visible on the images that I've kept at the bottom. I started as a journalist in a typewriter, moved on to electronic typewriter, tele and then computer, and then now we are all on our smartphones. So change is something that's going to be happening to all of us. And the future is going to be therefore very different from what we call it today. And to the point of this young, of the gentleman there that the people who we work with now are no longer doing what we used to do. Sir, we are living in their world. They are not living in ours. So we have to therefore adjust to their world. We have to learn their, their trends and, and that's what future is all about. Now, for me, the future, any time you think of future, I only can think of how to let it go. Every time I have shifted my job, every time I have moved from one organization to the next. It has been a huge amount of unlearning. So what is it that you need to let go of? You need to let go of your old learning, old habits, and of course your prejudices. So again, I go back to the conversation that just happened. Our old learnings expect our future generations to behave in a particular manner, whereas the truth of the matter is it's not going to be that. And we have to be fine with it. We have to be just OK with it. So I'll give you a few anecdotes about my prejudice with my 
my job. Like when I first started working, there was nothing so well defined as internal comms, external comms, online reputation management, policy comms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, those are things that have happened over the years. So for me, my larger part of my career was external comms. I mean, we all pretty much started with man managing media relations. And one fine day, I move to an organization where I'm asked to do internal comms. And I just, I just couldn't deal with it. Because I felt it was a step down. Because everything, so working with journalists, influencing column CCs, influencing the external narrative was such a huge high. And suddenly you were asked to do something which was absolutely not going to be that. But the thing is, over a period of time when I embraced it, I realized what a huge power that has. And in today's world of social media with Glassdoor and similar apps, you will realize how important it is to have a very strong employee culture and very clear engagement with the employees as they are progressing in their journey. So therefore, my prejudice had to change. And it had to become a power, from power, prejudice to power. The second thing that I would like to share with you, which is quite interesting, is when I used to work with Airtel and I used to head the communication function there, I used to work with eight agencies, 22 people across three countries. Uh, it was a massive, it was huge. It was at that time the market leader and we were also dealing with the 2G scam. So the industry was under pressure. The market leader had to always step up. So the speed of execution, speed of decision, speed of strategizing, everything had to be at a humongous level. I mean, I don't think I have ever ha worked in any organization uh, which has challenged me more than the organization that I'm talking about. So for me, speed of work was very important. That if you were good, you were able to do things quickly. It was almost like a Maggie noodle kind of a situation. But when I joined GSK, it all changed. GSK's culture was from pharma culture. GSK, I used to work with GSK Consumer Healthcare. Now, pharma culture is a very different kind of culture. It does not like speed. It tells you speed is bad. Because speed comes in the way of you deliberating your decisions in a scientific manner. Again, my prejudice was there in front of my face. And I was like, whoops, I need to change. I need to move. So every time something comes up and everybody who is in their beginning of their journey or the middle of the course of your journey, it's very important for you to know that a lot of stuff that made sense to us yesterday may not make sense to us tomorrow and that's okay because we always say how did how did this happen and why is it happening and why isn't it happening the way i know because it's pushing me out of my comfort zone that's exactly when you need to just reflect on that and say that yes it's okay it's okay to be different so therefore the power of unlearning is something that we need to embrace in the way that we are progressing in our career. The second anecdote to this that I would like to share with you was when I started my career, I was working with a very small organization. It was a hospitality industry that I started with where there was the founder who was also my boss. Uh, aligning them was so easy and getting things done was easy. Budgets used to be rationalized quickly. You were getting permission to do everything so easily. But when I moved from there to the first job, which was a, a listed entity, which was SpiceJet, everything changed. You couldn't do things the way you wanted to do. You had to deliberate on things in a very different way. You needed to understand the guardrails. You needed to be able to understand how to, within that guardrails, operate the way which was efficient for you. So again, we had to learn something completely different and embrace it. Everybody talks about 
uh, this embracing of things can be very difficult. And now that I'm doing a lot of mentoring, the other day I was having a conversation with one of my mentees and uh, she says, yes, I understand embracing. But I don't know how to embrace. I would rather do something on my own. I don't know how to embrace the change of working with a larger group of people because I have always learned to do things on my own. So it was very interesting the way she broke it down. She says, you know, at the beginning of embrace is the, is the permission that you give yourself to step out of your comfort zone. And the second phase that she identified for herself was to say that when you embrace, when you are looking to embrace something, you should be open to a completely new learning, which means you have to start challenging yourself, not only just move out of your comfort zone, but also start challenging yourself. And only then, after that, you can actually come down to embracing. So embracing is also not a, such a simple thing that we kind of constantly talk about. It's also something that we have to rationally work through. And in that conversation came out my next point, which was about trust. Everybody that is in this room and outside of this room listening into the conversation, I think we are all working on something as fragile as trust. What are we doing with our everyday work? We are actually building trust. Or if we do it incorrectly, we are breaking that trust. But what is happening in today's world? I think our generation had it easy. And I agree with Mukesh when he says that we have to cut some slack, and Akansha also mentioned that we have to cut, cut some slack for the next generation. When I woke up in the morning, I read only five newspapers. That was it, five newspapers, for at least five, four, first four years of my career. When you wake up today, I don't know what you do, you probably go to five apps, you check, Facebook, Twitter, and God alone knows what else. LinkedIn, LinkedIn has become another important. So when you are in a situation, you're in a, working in an environment like this where information is being thrown at you at a speed which is much faster than you can actually absorb and assimilate, you're also wondering which one should I trust? And technology and its innovations have put strangest things in our corner with deep fakes and what have you. The other day my ex-organization uh, um, Airtel announced that they are going to put out the word suspected spam before every call that they sense is a, is a spam. Now when I get a message from my bank saying that your check, and which I did get actually yesterday, your check amount of X amount could not be honored because it's, it's more than the balance that you're supposed to, please click on this link. I couldn't. I sent that message across to my RM and said, should I? He said, but ma'am, it's come from Access Bank. I said, but how do I know this is Access Bank? So I think you have it tougher than we did because every step you, are ha you actually have to turn back and ask, am I doing the right thing? Is this kosher? Then move yourself up a little bit and see how initially, I think somebody just touched upon this point, that uh, we need to understand the ownership of media houses. That's a given. You need to understand the geopolitical situation in which you operate. So there was thing that we used to always hear at one time, you know, content is king. And I used to always tell people, context is king. Content is, you know, that famous uh, experiment that was done by Wall Street Journal of that uh, performer in the New York uh, subway. Well, probably, if you look it up, it'll probably be the same. Just to give you a little bit of flavor, it was a musician who was uh, getting $300 tickets in the New York uh, theaters, was performing at the subway, and nobody even paused and listened to him. It's the same content by the same guy. So I always used to say that content is absolutely irrelevant without the context. So the sweet spot is always between the content and the context. 
So in this situation, where your life is all about dopamine hit, like you get one hit, move on to the next hit, and in between that you have a little time to catch your breath and see how you will influence the next moment. Who do you trust? And most importantly, who will trust you? The person who is doom scrolling constantly, why will they pause and absorb what you are sharing? Why will they pause and actually buy what you are selling? So again, in a very interesting conversation with, a, with one of my other mentees where she was like, I don't know who to trust. I don't know who to trust in my office because today I had a boss, tomorrow the boss is gone. My teams keep changing. I keep gain, getting assigned to different jobs and different clients and I don't know who to trust. So then my question, and she was actually very, very upset about it. She said, we have been brought up in trusting in relationships from the values that are at home. Somebody was referencing values at home. But she says, when I come to this situation, who do I trust? And even if I trust that person, how do I know that person is telling me what I want, what is good for me, what is good for my client? So my response was that don't trust if you can't trust, but trust in that moment. So don't trust me for everything that I say, but trust this moment that you are spending with me. And make, if that moment works for you, then let that be the moment that works, as opposed to trying to figure out, can I trust this person? Because in today's world, again, as I'm saying, you guys have it tougher. 30 years ago, I trusted Times of India and Economic Times with my eyes shut. If I say that today, I'll be a fool. And I see some smiles around the room because you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm just saying that it is, the world is moving at a pace, not just with technology, but it is moving at a pace which is really, really different and difficult for us to kind of, you know, get our arms around. Uh, so that's why I call it Insta Trust. But I also linked to that, I also believe that there is nothing that is permanent. So this particular thought has actually come from one of my favorite musicals, which I yet have to see on stage, Hamilton. And it clearly says that nothing is, nothing is promised. This moment, this is the moment we have. We don't know what's coming up next. So if you are to build trust, again, going back to my earlier topic, build trust in this moment. Because you guys are living Insta lives. Your lives are all about reels and disappearing messages. We used to have those long form content that used to stay and we used to file and we used to put it away. That's not happening anymore. So in this kind of a situation, what is it that you will do in this kind of a life? So just to give a little bit of personal example, my son is right now in the US. Uh, he's doing internship in a, with, with a, one of the state governments and um, He's desperately trying for a job, and the job market there is horrible. And he's just graduated out of one of the top five colleges in the US in computer science. But he trusts in that internship. He's making that work for him. He is making that grow for him. He's finding joy in that. And I think that is the most beautiful thing that I see about our next generation. That they do not hold back the joy that is there in the moment, that is there in this, this time and this space, but wondering what is going to happen next. So linked to that is, and I keep, I, of course, I have always told him when he was a child, is that nothing is promised. So just wherever you are, whatever you're doing, make the most of it. So we always talk about the future, which is, which is very different kind of a future. 
than what we have. Like my, the future that I'm looking at is very different from the past that I have had. Now, the future therefore doesn't belong to anybody. And I was listening to a podcast the other day by Yuval Noha Harari, and he said that first time that he is sensing that it's very difficult to predict what is going to happen in the next 20 years. He is saying that the technological changes are so rapid. Innovation and uptake of innovation has been furious. And the geopolitical changes are tectonic. He is saying, I cannot predict for the first time. We can't predict what's going to happen in the US elections. Look at the exit polls in India. They couldn't predict. So, future is therefore, it belongs to nobody. We are all trying to say life things and the future is yours. No. That can be the truth here and now, but going forward it may just all change. So it actually, if something belongs to nobody, then everybody has a stake in it. So everybody sitting in the room has an equal stake in the future. So go grab it. Make it your own. Be fearless about what do you want out of that future? And that is possibly what is going to help you control the chaos. There will be chaos. And I was listening to a few questions saying, what can we do with crisis management? And, you know, crisis used to be for us, it had a 24-hour news cycle. It used to come and it used to hit us the next day. We went home. But crisis now, you wake up in the middle of the night. Now, nobody has for a minute thought that Kunal Kamra's tweet is going to devalue an, a, a, a company. We couldn't have imagined. This is a no, no playbook across any agency, any corporate. And trust me when I say this, I have seen a few. So you have to constantly evolve. You have to constantly, uh, you know, look at getting things done in a different way. And the whole thing about crisis and whole thing about the future is uh, shape it the way you feel it is going to be important for you. Now, everybody says that there has to be some five, six takeaways. So I have also my very simple five, six takeaways for the future, which may or may not work. And I am standing here and saying this to you today because I think it might work. So for whatever it's worth, take it with a pinch of salt. First I see is that, you know, we talk about segmentation a lot. Anybody who has come from the, you know, um, management background here? Yeah, so everybody in the management background, you have been taught segmentation till you were hating that word, right? We in PR have been introduced to segmentation very grudgingly. We have taken segmentation. PR was all chiffons and pearls. It was all partnerships and relationships. We started understanding businesses much later. And there's nothing wrong about it. That's how it evolved. But the future, your segmentation is going to be what the game is going to be all about. Because your uh, audience sitting on Insta will be very different from the one on Facebook. And they will be very different from the one which is on a, some other social media platform. So, and I'll give you one example from my last job. Uh, in uh, Unilever, actually Hindustan Unilever, we had a project called WIMI. Winning in many Indias. We had taken the segmentation concept to like a fine art, if I may say. Because India, and we can only talk about India right now, India changes every 100 kilometers. And that is what your segmentation is about. So we had actually created all our work in terms of going to market basis that segmentation. So therefore, segmentation is going to be very important. The next thing that is going to be very important is the understanding of a larger context. 
in which you operate. When we had started our career, our jobs were just our little organization and maybe the industry in which we operated. It is not going to work that way. And I'll tell you, we'll give you one example on a recent conversation that I had with a uh, owner of a hotel chain. And uh, she asked me, so what do you think of the market? I said, market is in absolute shit. She's saying, but we are doing so well. I said, it's gonna hit you. Because there is no buoyancy in rural. There is, the middle class is shrinking. There is no, there's going to be no extra money for people to come and enjoy indulgences. So it's gonna come and hit you. So watch out for it. And then we saw this article that came out yesterday when, uh, when uh, the CEO of Nestle talked about the shrinking middle class and the dif difficulty of the rural India. The second thing is that this tech thing, you know, the last three years we have absolutely been shivering in our shoes about AI. AI is that monster that will gobble us all. What we are not thinking is AI has been around for a long time. AI is not something that has just taken birth. What we are not talking about is policy changes will gobble you faster than AI. And we are not talking about it. If you are not able to understand the way your businesses are being allowed to operate, then you will one day find yourself with an empty, like a shell. So tech is actually a great enabler for us. Like when I used to sit and type out press releases on an electronic typewriter, I could not correct. I had to put white ink and type on top of that. Some people in the room know what I'm talking about. The others are saying she's just, she's, she's smoked up. <laughs> but that is the truth. Today you can edit documents. You can edit documents on your handphones. And your smartphone gives you the ability to create PPTs and videos and content sitting here. So use tech as an enabler. Tech is a fabulous enabler. I've spent three and a half years working for a tech-aided company and I know how amazingly it can actually transform lives. I also see there's a desperate need for collaboration and partnership. I've never seen this before. I have seen, I've started seeing that communities are trying to come together. You know, we live in all these buildings, condominiums. We are all leaving the houses at 8 o'clock in the morning and we come back at, say, 8 o'clock in the night. We don't know our neighbors. But people want to know other people like them. So groups are forming, WhatsApp groups. How many of you are in part of at least 20 WhatsApp groups? I don't know how many I am a part of. But in that you will see, what are, what are those things? You will see people will put on disappearing messages and they will discuss stuff that might not be good to send out. That's their safe space. Now, figure out how can you play in that? Because it doesn't matter what page one of ET is saying. If you are dissed in that WhatsApp group, Nobody's going to buy that. At least that cohort is not going to buy it. And that cohort is going to influence five others. So think about it. I also think that, uh, you know, we keep these slides very heavy. In my first slide, one slide was very heavy. I just purposely wanted to keep that, just to give a contrast with this. Go simple and connect. When you write presentations and I have worked with many agencies and it's been a, one of my biggest grouse with them and I don't see any of my old agency partners sitting in the room which is nice so I can be sharing this. I should just tell them that if you write a sentence using more than five words and if your argument has more than three points, you have lost the room. Write shorter, crisper, tighter, meaningful content which at least will fly, people will read. I also finally, I think I also feel that this function, and probably only this function, has the only opportunity of becoming fact checkers and not fiction makers. You will all have the opportunity to correct. 
either correct your own work, correct the people around you, and that's, that's like superpower. Use that. Because you are entering a future which is very chaotic. You're entering a future where information is going to come from various different sources. You are entering a future where tech will trick you. It will enable you, but every enabler tricks you. So in that future, the choice is, will you be the fact checkers? Or will you be the fiction makers? Because the more fiction you make, facts die. And that's a horrible future to be in. Thank you. That was my last point. Any questions? Happy to take. Thank so you. So we do have a lot of questions here, starting with you, sir. Uh, very nice presentation. My name is Samir. I'm a media consultant. I just would like to point out um, the current uh, debate on Twitter as you were speaking is um, a campaign run by Yuvraj Singh's agency. Uh, it talks about breast cancer and it says about... Uh, the oranges. Yeah. Can you comment on that? I think... Uh, <laughs> so the way I will look at any campaign is that is it hitting the audience. How many of you have seen that campaign? Many women here. Please raise your hand. If, it has, if only three hands go up, then it hasn't hit the target audience. It's not about the men. The men can, yes, of course, tell their wives or daughters or sisters to go and get it done. Get a, uh, so we are talking about a campaign about breast cancer awareness and to go and check yourselves. So basically, so I think sometimes our contents tend to be a little smart and we miss the point. So uh, my only submission here is uh, I wasn't a part of that discussion. I don't know exactly what the brief was, but I would say that when you are looking at creating a content, keep it simple, keep it to the point, make it attractive, make it smart, make it intelligent, make it quirky, but don't make it so much out of the box that people are unable to even recall it. And, it's, and, and campaigns are not made for getting awards. I think awards are, uh, you know, we all get awards, so I'm happy for that. Yeah, any other questions? Okay, so we do have one here. Um, good afternoon, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you uh, for, uh, you know, addressing the uh, aspect of context. It's so important to, and, and also I think like uh, to have some uh, intuition, common sense, along with just not being limited to content creators, creators. I think that has become an overused term nowadays. Chat and GPT. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I think that, that uh, for addressing all the fundamentals so beautifully, and you're such a wonderful storyteller Thank with these you. anecdotes. And I think we need uh, more and more uh, role models and mentors like you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's very That's kind. Very Thank you. Ma'am, you gave an example of your son. Yeah. The trust is very important. And he's on internship and uh, I wish he should get the good job. From your lips to God's ears, sir. Sure. One person, one person. If the job is not meeting his requirement, what about the trust? Sorry, what? What about the trust he is having? So, uh, meeting his requirements can mean many things. Yeah, I know. So, meeting no, no. his requirements can be, is it meeting my financial requirement? Is it meeting my growth aspiration? Is it meeting my, uh, you know, like no, my work-life balance? Wrong, I use the wrong word, expectation. Okay. So, same thing. Again, the expectation. We all have, like, I would love to earn in billions. I'm not going to. I would love my face on uh, the front page of Newsweek. It's not going to happen. So uh, I'm just saying that uh, those are aspirations. And of course, it's a damn good to have aspirations. I've always told everybody, be greedy. There's nothing wrong with greed, as long as you don't harm anybody. Exactly. Be greedy for somebody else's, you know, like learning. Be greedy for something better for yourself. Be greedy for something better for your family. Be greedy for improving. But that doesn't mean that do it by harming someone else. That's not, that's where it, the line is drawn. But trust, I think, yes, you may say that if I don't get what I want, exactly. then how can I trust anything? 
But, you know, I think we all need to reflect. Like, as I said, I would love to have had my face on the cover of the Newsweek. Sir, it never happened. But am I going to break my head over it? I think tra uh, expectations are, have to be grounded in some kind of reality. So I can't get up in the morning and say, I told you this and you didn't give me, so I'm going to go into a permanent sulk. Then I think I'm 12. I may have to grow up. But so expectation and reality, I think, has to be in hand in hand in order to be able to understand how trust works. But That's the way I would a, look at it. But there is a difference between your... Thank you.